The lesson that Randy just read, but they did not understand what he was saying and they were afraid to ask him. Matt Skinner is a professor at Luther Seminary. Matt had a line that I thought, of all the things that I've listened to, Matt said it. And, and Matt is, he's not your warm and fuzzy guy. He, he's an extraordinary academic. He's got one of our best minds in the Lutheran church and probably one of the best minds in church theological education around the globe. Uh, but Matt said, if he could title a sermon, he would have titled today, The Tragedy of the Lack of Curiosity. The Tragedy of the Lack of Curiosity. And that has been something that I've experienced for 37 years in ministry. When I sit with a person and I know that they don't really have any interest in growing or deepening their faith that they don't really want to learn more pieces of the puzzle. And many of them tragically think, well, yeah, but if I really start following the words of the Bible, if I really start following the mission of the church to love God and love all people, I'm going to have to change. And the only word I can come up with to that kind of a response that gosh, you know, I'm probably going to have to change if I listen to the words of Jesus. And I don't mean, some of you have said at times I throw out big words, and some of you have said, you know, Bob, okay, you're flashing your education, so I just want to give you a heads up, it's a big word. Duh! Of course you're going to have to change. And of course your behavior is going to have to shift. No kidding. No kidding. Um, they just didn't understand. But at least the disciples wanted to understand. And we see in today's lesson, in the ninth chapter of Mark, we see that as they journeyed. So what are you arguing about? Now Jesus knew what they were arguing about. He knew that it was going to be one of those little elementary school, on the playground kind of arguments that, believe it or not, there are churches out there that that kind of stuff actually happens, that people are competitive and, you know, who's going to get closer to Jesus? They were arguing about that. Who's the greatest among us? And the disciples, then, it says, they were silent. Because they were arguing over something that they, they knew. That Jesus was going to say, knock it off. Quit being so petty. But then he throws us a ringer. Whoever wants to be the first must be the last. And they have to be a servant. Well, you can have servants in churches that are really, really good members because while they want and desire to get a pat in the back, a natural, normal thing to do to encourage one another. I mean, could you imagine coaching, coaching the baseball team in Boyertown and saying to your guys on the bench, whatever you do, don't praise your teammate. Whatever you do, don't. When they make a mistake, if anything, lay it on them. But if they do something really, really good, don't let them know. Because they might just think that's good enough. So just only pick on the mistakes. Whoever wants to be the first must be the last of all and a servant. I've been a part of churches for over four decades. And I've seen people that work their, li their living arms off for the church. But they do it for the wrong reasons. And it actually stains the church. And it stains the kingdom of God. Because it's more about them than it's about others. I have never seen Lisa, I've never heard her communicate about Operation 143, that it's in any way, shape, or form about her. I've never seen or heard her 
I have heard her say she's frustrated. I have heard her say she's tired. I have heard her say people don't get it. I have heard her say the, the mindset oftentimes of our area is we don't really have hungry people because the wish and the dream is I think our people really don't want to have anybody hungry because if they did know it, they'd have to do something about it or they'd have to turn the channel and stop watching the SPCA commercials. I hate those commercials. Hate those commercials. But do you notice how they often, they only show dogs, they don't really show a lot of cats. What's up with that? I watched one the other day and I looked at it and I thought, wait, where's the cat? I'm starting to like cats. I'm starting to like cats. See? There's, everybody can change. How do you understand this passage? How do you understand the passage where the disciples are complaining about each other? And they're trying to figure out. You know, Peter thinks he's the best. Judas thinks he's the best. Matthew thinks he's the best. They're arguing over who's the greatest among us. Who's going to be seated next to Jesus? Who's going to be closest? You want to be a good servant. And I believe to be a good servant, your heart has to be in a direction where you do for others above self. But I also believe that if there's a vulnerability in this congregation, it's that we really don't spend much time at all authentically saying, Sam, thank you for being with us. Well, why do we have to thank him? Doesn't he get paid? You do realize that that's just a really odd behavior to say that. Well, that's what we pay him for. The New Testament is about behavior. And it's Paul saying in most cases... He finds the thing to praise them. And then the document shifts to the correctives. The same guys that are walking down the lane in the ninth chapter of Mark, moaning and groaning about each other, competing with each other, trying to figure out who's the greatest among them. I mean, is Tiger Woods really the goat? Greatest of all time, G-O-A-T. Is Tiger Woods really the greatest of all? I mean, it's golf, right? Now, if we want to talk runners, that's a different story. How do you understand this passage? Do you understand that the same people that were arguing about who's the greatest among us, four of them wrote something called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in Matthew's story, Matthew tells the story about how Judas made a mistake. Matthew tells the story three separate times of how badly Peter's behavior was. Now, maybe walking down the lane in the ninth chapter of Mark, Matthew's saying, I'm better than you, sucker. Look what you just did. I mean, you numbskull, you thought you could walk on water and look what happened to you. And then can you imagine the stories if it got as far as you didn't just deny that you knew our Lord. You did it three times. Those gospels don't just talk about the bad stuff that happened that a person may have done. They talk about the love that those people had, and how after the bad, there was an act of mercy granted to them by Jesus face to face. And then they told the story of the reparation, the restorative justice, where the two of them or the many of them were able to see what they had done wrong, confess it, broken heart, you know my style. If I know it's a behavior that's indicative of our system, I will be relentless in holding up, holding up, holding up until you finally say authentically, oh my gosh, yeah, that was really dumb. 
But here's the trick. You heard some kids the other day say, yeah, I was really an idiot. I was really stupid. Stop it. You heard me say that. Knock it off. Because if they really are, if you really think you're an idiot, you're an idiot. No. <laughs> if you really think you're an idiot, somebody never taught you, your behavior may have been idiotic, may have been foolish. But you're not a fool, and you're not an idiot, and you're not stupid. But labels stick, and self-imposed labels are the hardest to remove. So if you hear me name someone, you better understand, or if not, I can't do anything for you, you better understand, if I mention Sam, and I mention Sam, and this is what he did, 10 years ago, and it was really, really awful, I have the ability to separate that person from their behavior. Do you? I have the ability to look at Peter and not just see where he lacked faith. Hey, if his lack of faith was he got up out of the boat and jumped out, how many of you would have jumped out of the boat? I would not have. I would not have been that good. But if you can't separate the two, then it's going to be really tough for you to do church. And especially advanced discipleship. Because you've got to be able to separate the past from the person. You have to be able to separate their behavior. Their behavior may have set you up for failure. Their behavior may have caused people irreparable damage. But the reparations come when you recognize and you have the ability to separate the two. How many of you think you understand what I just said? If you do, please be radically Lutheran and raise your hand. All right, then we're getting there. We're getting there. You and I sit in offices frequently, so do others, and we hear the stories of people. In fact, the best thing they can do is come in and tell us the truth because then we can start to help them unweave it and unwind it. What do you think those kids need? What do you think we should do if we have that parked in our parking lot? This is what we offered. If you don't have anything better to do on a Saturday night, come talk to us and how about we have a pizza party? How about you invite a hundred of your friends to show up in our fellowship hall and let's serve you pizza. But let's give you a place to be so you don't have to run around a parking lot. We also said, how about you bring one of your garage bands? They said, we don't have garage bands anymore. We don't do that stuff anymore? Boy, that's going to be a loss. That's a real loss. When you get, you know, you know what a garage band is, right? It's Ehrlich with instruments. Both of them chase away the rodents. It's, it just, it's, it's just fun. It's just fun. I mean, we could have a garage band. We could do it right now. We could get the lead singer up here right now. Who do you want as the lead singer? Sam. So you put the lead singer up here, right? So you get, so come on over here, Sam. So be the lead singer. Now, we got a label on him. He's the lead singer. So what's he singing about? Because is he going to need, what's he singing about? What do you want him to sing about? God? Well, and he's going to need a guitar. So the only one that I know in here that plays the air guitar is Scott Shirey. Scott plays the air guitar and embarrasses Hannah and Becky all the time. But do you think that's going to stop him? I was waiting for him at Grandview the other night. I went up to see John, John Gear and Scott invited me to come along to Grandview. And, and boy, is that... That's a place. <laughs> and, and, and I'm thinking between Grandview and Jake's, they ought to have their own zip code. Because <laughs> there are more people there. And they are gathered around some really cool things. Why are you laughing? And I thought Scott was going to be up front when they sang the national anthem. And I just assumed he'd be playing it on his air guitar. I have this vision. Do you have a vision of the boys walking along the road, kibitzing with each other, and Jesus saying, you know, how many of you said this at your families? Do you ever say this to the girls? I know the girls never argued. Do you ever say, you know what? You're, you're each, each other's, I'm just making it up, you're each other's best friend, and you may be fighting right now, but for the rest of your lives, you're stuck with each other, so make it work. Do you ever say that? You've ever said that? <laughs> have you ever heard those words? Only from Melissa only heard those words, right? <laughs> Melissa's the rotten kid. She's not here to defend herself. Um, 
you know what? I could just see her go like this. <laughs> Isn't that what Jesus was kind of sort of probably saying? Oh, someday you're going to write this story. And you're going to talk about how, yeah, you should have gone to jail. And huh, what you did was you really messed up that place and you said some really dumb things. And, uh, and you're so self-centered. And next thing you know, I'm going to change your heart. And I'm going to offer you the most intrusive, invasive injection, infusion of love. I wish I could have more of that in me. And I wish I were a medical doctor that had a holster full of syringes of love and self-awareness. And the ability to separate the person from the behavior so we just wouldn't get annoyed and mess up everything that God wants to do through us because of our egos.